Hey, how's it going? Today's video is a little different, and no doubt, perhaps, curiosity compelled you to click on the video, and obviously we're gonna be playing Pokemon Red and Blue, but with a Garchomp, and there's no secret as to why this Pokemon is as popular as it's become. It's Generation 4's pseudo-legendary, and not only is it Dragon-type, but its design is essentially everything you would check off a list of what makes a Pokemon cool. Dragon-type, check. Based on a shark, check. Based on a fighter jet, check. Has little baby scythe hands, check. What's not to love? There are probably two people out there that don't appreciate Garchomp's cool factor, and they only do so to be contrarian because they think it's cool to hate what is popular. Uh, why don't you just get a life, Randall? So you might be saying, Matt, how are you doing this? What sort of witchcraft is this? Well, big guy, take a step back and listen. I'm utilizing the Sanqui randomizer tool. That's S-A-N-Q-U-I, and I'm sure Google can help you out if you need that. Essentially, I'm just using Garchomp from a randomized start. The trainers, the items, the wild Pokemon, all of it remains the same like we know and love. The only real difference is that moves and types are updated for Generation 7, so that means moves like Bite will now be Dark type, uh, Pokemon like Jigglypuff will be a Fairy type, and so on and so forth. Uh, the only minor difference here is that a lot of these sprites are from Pokemon Green, so that's a little bit interesting. Overall, this is a fun little run. We're not going to get too analytical at the start. All you really need to know is Garchomp has a massive 130 attack, just like Machamp, and those two are very comparable because their final move sets are fairly similar, but Garchomp has two massive improvements, and that is that its speed is roughly doubled and Earthquake gets stabbed, which are both fantastic bonuses to have. As far as moves goes, I won't have a chart for the TMs for obvious reasons. The creator that put the later gen Pokemon into red and blue were pretty faithful, but Generation 1 has different TMs and I don't have a list for it. Last thing I'll say real quickly is that if you enjoy this content, feel free to subscribe, click that little bell. It helps out the channel a ton. I generally do Pokemon challenge runs about once a week. Any comments at all also help me break free of the small channel YouTube algorithm. So if you want to do your part, I'd really appreciate it. With that said, grab yourself a Sodi Pop. Let's dive into it. Like with all runs, and although it's a lot harder to check uh, accurately with the mod, I do reset for some decent DVs for Garchomp. It's not as important in a fun run like this, but let's be honest here, who really wants to play with some zero DV trash Pokemon? Also, can we just appreciate this sprout artwork here? Just look at our little sharky boy. It kind of looks like he's doing a dab, but that's alright, we'll forgive him. I think the aesthetic fits very well with Generation 1, and great job to whoever designed these. The first rival battle is over in an instant, but it's our first look at Dragon Rage. It one-shots the Bulbasaur. We also have Sand Attack, although I don't use it a single time in the entire run. And we have Tackle, which exists solely to extend our time between having to get our PP back at the Poke Center. After minimum battles with the one Bug Catcher in Viridian, it's time for Brock. And I don't need to harp on how strong Dragon Rage is early in the game. A flat 40 HP damaging move is enough to one-shot almost any Pokemon minus maybe Misty Starmie, at least up to Vermilion City, and this is about as easy as a Brock fight's gonna get. Moving along, I don't heal after Brock, and I'd like to point out this ludicrous walk through Mount Moon. I didn't use any manipulations or anything like that, and look how long it is before I get an encounter. This kind of luck is actually absurd, but going through here, I carefully manage my PP through this section, so I don't have to heal until Cerulean, and then it's on to rival number two. And this fight isn't hard. Dragon Rage is still at its peak power for the Pidgeotto so I don't take the dreaded sand attack. And I do utilize Tackle to preserve PP for the following route and use Dragon Rage on Bulbasaur because that Vine Whip still hurts. And at this point, uh, reading the script, I'm kind of realizing I'm saying PP entirely too much already this early in the video. The preceding round is nothing worth mentioning other than I fight this optional hiker here so I can get an extra elixir to extend my time out in the field without visiting a Pokemon Center. And Garchomp has learned takedown uh, sometime on the Nugget Bridge, which is powerful if you have enough potions to offset the recoil damage. And from there, it's time for Misty. This fight is tricky. Staryu isn't an issue, but Starmie does some heavy damage. And we don't see it here. Here, but from my test runs, I do know that Starmie has access to goddamn Hydro Pump. Hydro Pump! Going off of this bubble beam damage here, uh, you can only imagine how quick one of these uh, bad boys would demolish Garchomp. Uh, I'd end up in the ninth realm for sure. I do call a slight audible here after this, and it's that I don't teach Garchomp Dig. 
I know it's a massive 100 base power stab move, but we know that we'll eventually replace it with Earthquake, and having Dig on Paris is a good time save, and I believe Garchomp is powerful enough to not lose any time holding off on Dig in favor of waiting for that juicy Earthquake for a little bit. And here's where it's uh, it's worth noting that these two junior trainers before Vermilion is about the point where Dragon Rage stops one-shotting all the Pokemon. And now moving on to the SSN, Garchomp sadly cannot learn Body Slam, and in the interest of getting the best time we can get, I do skip the gentleman guarding the rare candy in favor of immediately fighting rival number 3, and this fight isn't too bad. I opt to go for takedown against Pidgeotto, but I don't one hit it. There's no sand attack follow up, and that's great. A tackle gets past it with zero issues. I utilize a mix of moves to get past the rest of the Pokemon, and I have the Dragon Rage, the Ivysaur, it's still a two shot. We dodge a huge bullet by getting the 25% chance for Sleep Powder to miss, or it would have pretty much assuredly been a reset, but it's another one shot battle. We get cut after that, and it's time for Lieutenant Surge, and as a ground type, this fight's not bad, and you would think that Dig would be a time save here, but it's a two turn move, and we could two shot all of his Pokemon anyway, so it's really not. It may be safer however, the Raichu does get off some quick attacks and it takes us all the way down to 24 HP, but as you'd expect, this is one of the easier fights in the game, Dig isn't needed, we're moving on. Moving along, the only thing worth mentioning in Rock Tunnel is that Garchomp learns a new move in Dual Chop. Think Double Kick, but a little bit stronger. 40 base power that hits twice and has a 90% accuracy. It's definitely better than Tackle since it has stab damage, but it's worth noting that all Dragon moves are special in Generation 1, so it's not that great for Garchomp. But from there, we eventually move on to Celadon, and the first order of business is to get a fresh water for the Guard and Saffron, and pick up a Sodi Pop to give us access to Rock Slide for some much needed coverage for some key battles later in the game. After that, I pick up Fly, and this isn't important, but what's weird is that in this ROM, Paris can learn Fly, and I'm not sure why. Uh, I researched it. I looked at all of its learn sets all the way up to Generation 7, and I came up with nothing. Uh, leave a comment if you know why I'm confused. Why can Paris learn fly? From there, I hit up the rocket hideout. I grab the PP up, and after that, it's time for Giovanni number one. And once again, you might think that Dig would be better for this fight, but just like last time, it's a two turn move, and I can finish them off in two turns without it, so it works out to be the same. The Kangaskhan does get me a little bit low since it has Mega Punch with this ROM, uh, some move updates, but it's nothing too concerning. And with Sylph Scope in hand, it's time for Pokemon Tower, and that means rival number four. And in hindsight, I probably should have reset here because I didn't have Rock Slide taught on Garchomp, but I don't. The battle still isn't that bad, and we learn Slash. It's nothing crazy, but with Generations 1 crit rate uh, based off of your speed, and it has an 8x multiplier, it means that Slash is a guaranteed hit 100% of the time, and that makes it really great for mowing down any minor trainers uh, at this stage in the game. Moving on, here's a funny bug where visually the Marowak in Pokemon Tower looks like Zapdos. It's not actually a Zapdos, I tested it, but it did make me do a Tim Allen home improvement style grunt the first time that I seen it. After obtaining the Poke Flute, Sylph Company is unlocked, and I don't want to complete it just yet, I'm not ready for that, but it's a great opportunity to pick up Earthquake to really give us a power boost. I also pick up Swords Dance for later in the game, and I clear the path all the way up to rival number 5 before proceeding to our normal route in the game. From there I cycle down to Fuchsia City and it's time for Koga and this has got to be the easiest Koga battle I've ever seen in my entire life. 4 Pokemon, 4 Earthquakes, that's it. The strategy isn't really too in depth here guys. I pick up the final way gems from Safari Zone and then I backtrack to Celadon where it's time to face Erika and we're just cruising through the game right now. The neutral damage from Earthquake just bodies the Victory Bell. Two slashes can then just take out the Tangela, and then Vileplume cannot survive a single Earthquake. And that's another very easy gem taken care of by Garchomp. Pretty impressive so far. Now it's time for rival number 5, and it's easy to get to since we've already cleared a path to it earlier. Now that we have Rock Slide in the move pool, Pidgeot doesn't stand a chance. I hit a string of bad luck and I miss consecutive Rock Slides against Gyarados, and I do get fairly low, but this allows us to see the pure power of Garchomp. Who really cares if you are low or under leveled when you can just one shot everything, duh. Next up is Giovanni number 2, and this is very similar to the first Giovanni encounter. But this time we have Earthquake, Kangaskhan does get some solid hits once again, but the rest of the Pokemon fall quickly to Earthquake and once again, we are moving on. 
After that, the last three gems are fairly rapid fire. First up is Sabrina, and Earthquake just absolutely demolishes her defensively frail Pokemon. The only interesting thing is that Mr. Mime is part fairy, but me being weak to fairy doesn't really come into play, it's just an observation, if anything. Then it's time for a brisk swim down to Cinnabar, and it's time to answer everyone's favorite question. Tombstoner, brother! Then it's on to Blaine. This fight is quick and easy. Garchomp is tailor-made to crush Blaine. The only wrinkle in this strategy is that I use Rock Slide to preserve some PP on Earthquake so that I can go to Giovanni without having to heal, and that's exactly what we do. The Giovanni Gym Leader fight is essentially the same as the others. Earthquake is super effective against most of his Pokemon, minus the Doug Trio, which essentially has a negative HP stat anyway. Not every hit is a one-shot, but it comes pretty close. And that's all the gyms down. Garchomp has has six battles to go. I book it over to rival number six, and let's see how that goes. And pretty well's the answer. Pidgeot is a one hit with Rock Slide, Rhyhorn is also a one hit with Earthquake, the Gyarados however, does survive a Rock Slide, and it punishes us hard with a heavy damage Hydro Pump. It turns out that gods can actually bleed. The rest of the fight is fairly surprising. Uh, not the Growlithe or the Alakazam, everyone kind of knew that they would be a one shot, but the Venusaur surprised me since it only takes neutral damage, but I guess the stab damage combined with that uh, easily just gets it done. Notice the level advantage in this fight. The slow leveling group that Garchomp is in is not the best. We are severely underleveled at this point. After that, I don't do any extracurricular activities in Victory Road, no trainer battles or anything like that. I don't even pick up the optional rare candy in the interest of saving as much time as possible. Before the Elite Four, I do use all but three of my rare candies since my level is so low, and I have the opportunity to learn Crunch, which isn't a bad move against Agatha maybe, but Earthquake kind of feels the same niche, but it's just overall better. I do learn Swords Dance over Slash, and that finalizes our beefy physical moveset, and with that we can just see how the Elite Four is actually going to go. The game has been honestly very easy up to this point with Garchomp, and I'm bright eyed, I'm bushy tailed, I'm ready to end things. My initial idea is that I would set up Sword Stance, then I would sweep through the entire team with Earthquake and Rock Slide, but it's not how it goes. I go in here, I set up once, I get hit with an Aurora Beam, and a non-critical hit, mind you, mixed with our times 4 weakness to ice, destroys us. It dashes our hopes and dreams instantly. The next attempt, it's very clear that I can't afford to set up any Swords Dance. A Rock Slide does take Dugong to a sliver of health, and we get lucky with a Retroactive Super Potion, and then we finish it off after that. The problems are not over here though. In this mod, Cloyster has Hydro Pump, and it does heavy damage, but eventually we do finish it off, we survive. Slowbro is up next, and it's a break in the fight. It uses Withdrawal, and I spend several turns taking it out. Why I didn't just set up Swords Dance is honestly a mystery to this day and eventually I do move on to the next Pokemon. Jinx is a non-issue, its defense stat is fairly low and it falls to an Earthquake with no issue. Lapras is up last, it does survive an Earthquake and it doesn't look like it would be a two-shot. We take a Water Pulse and that gets us pretty low, but we do get a very lucky crit and it gets us past this battle and honestly this is by far the hardest battle in the entire game for Garchomp. Next up is Bruno, and for the uninitiated, Bruno is a complete joke except under rare circumstances. This is not a rare circumstance. This battle is very easy, and every Pokemon folds like paper to Earthquake, even the Machamp. Stay pathetic, Bruno. Agatha is third, and if you know anything about Agatha, it's that if you have Earthquake, you're golden. We have the fortune of having a stabbed Earthquake, and we outspeed all but one of her Pokemon, so it's just one shot city here. Rock Slide is required for the Golbat, obviously, but the rest swiftly fall to Earthquake. The last Gengar does outspeed us, and it uses its fancy updated move from the ROM in Shadow Punch, but it's nowhere close to enough to finish us off. It can't escape the super effective Earthquake that's coming, and it's another easy battle. Lance is up fourth, and I was worried about this one a little bit. I have the tools, but Gyarados is scary. Thankfully, Arceus blesses us with a critical hit rock slide, and we don't even have to worry about the potential threat of a crit hydro pump. I want to take advantage of this opportunity and the luck I've gotten, so I set up two sword stance to ensure that I outspeed the rest of the battle. I take a little bit of damage, but this allows me to easily go on to one-shot the rest of the Pokemon. 
Two earthquakes take out the two dragonairs, and another rock slide is enough to take out the aerodactyl. One more rock slide, one hits the dragonite, and that's honestly surprising to me, but a Pokemon like Garchomp that's this strong with three swords dance is honestly pretty busted. We gotta be real with ourselves. Last up is the champion fight, and I'm looking to finish this one off clean. I use my rare candy pre-fight to reset my experience, and when the Pidgeot comes in, I fully set up all three swords dance to ensure that I'm the strongest little shark that I can possibly be. A follow up rock slide moves us on. Alakazam comes in, and it feels great to have a run where Alakazam isn't a raid boss. It's been like that the last several weeks. One earthquake moves us on, and from there another earthquake also takes out the Rhydon as well. Gyarados comes in, and you're about to start noticing a theme here. We are so boosted that a rock slide obliterates it. Arcanine joins the pile of bodies with another earthquake, and that leaves us left with Venusaur standing in the way between us and victory. And to absolutely no one's surprise, Stab Earthquake with three swords dance with some badge boost, trivialize it before it can even think of using its dreaded 100% crit razor leap. And that's the run. Garchomp is in the books. This was a really fun run, and I love that people have put the time and effort and care into converting later gen Pokemon into this game. As for Garchomp itself, how did it do? While this is only for fun, it's also equally as fun for me personally to compare times with past Pokemon that I've done runs with. And Garchomp finishes with a record level of 56, the lowest of all my runs, and its total time for the run is a very respectable time of 2 hours and 46 six minutes. If I bring up my tier list of the regular red and blue runs, you'll see that it's only two minutes behind the current fastest, which is Alakazam, and it ranks it second overall, edging out last week's Gengar run by a mere minute. As for my thoughts on Garchomp, I have to say that Gen 1 is dominated by special, and I love using a pure physical Pokemon because it's different. Its fantastic attack combined with Earthquake demolishes the game, and then when it's crunch time at the end, that mixed with Rock Slide gives it all the coverage that you need. With Swords Dance, it has easily one of the best movesets I've ever seen in Pokemon Red and Blue. And that's about all I have for you guys today. I plan on seeing how the rest of the dragons like Dialga and Palkia, uh, those kind of legendaries from Gen 4 do within the scope of Generation 1. And next up will more than likely be a very spooky episode featuring Garatina just because of it being Halloween, but the bar at this point is set really high with Garchomp, and I'd be surprised if anything can beat that, any of these new little runs I'm doing for fun. And with that said, I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!